This is The Wall Street Skinny, a podcast devoted to exploring the financial services industry and making the world of Wall Street accessible to everyone. Hey guys, welcome back to The Wall Street Skinny. I'm Jen. I'm Kristen. And we are two lifelong friends <laughs> on a mission to demystify the world of finance and give you the skinny on mm -hmm. some of the most elite high paying jobs in the world. And so today our theme of not taking any time off from our podcast in the month of December, as we had promised to do, continues. And yep. so you know how we love doing case studies to try to make more complex financial concepts really fun and easy to understand. And I mean, what is more fun than thinking about going to Las Vegas? You guys know that Kristen and I, or maybe you don't know, but Mm -hmm. In one of our earlier podcast episodes, we've told some of our Vegas stories. We went to Vegas in 2014 together, I think it was, yeah. to see Britney Spears when she had her residency at Planet Hollywood. And then, mm -hmm. Kristen, we did your bachelorette there two mm -hmm. years later in 2016. Yes. So yes. we thought it was very fitting that today we are going to talk about Sujit Indap's book, The Caesar's Palace Coup, to mm -hmm. explain LBO structuring. And this is going mm -hmm. to be our first actual LBO deep dive. Anyone mm -hmm. who wants to go into private equity or investment banking has to understand LBOs. And we've talked about them in the past. I mean, Kristen, you do such a great job explaining them, but we've <laughs> my, never- My house. <laughs> yeah, your house example. Exactly. But we've never gone into massive detail about the actual structure and mechanics. Mm -hmm. That's what we're doing today. And this is actually going to be kind of a three-part series because there's so much to unpack here. We can't tackle it all at once. Yep. Today's going to be our LBO deep dive. Part two will be more of a distressed debt and structuring masterclass. Mm -hmm. And that is so timely right now because in the current market environment, many companies that were LBO'd in the low rate regime that we were in for the past few years have debt coming due that they now will need to refinance at much higher rates. And that is a huge piece of what ultimately went wrong with the Caesars LBO. So we're going to give mm -hmm. you a bit of a, again, crash course in distressed debt, restructuring, and credit investing, which is super timely because I feel like that's all we're talking and reading about these uh, yeah. days is private Seriously. credit. Mm -hmm. And then in part three, we're actually going to bring on Sujit Indap, the author and Financial Times writer, to give us the inside scoop on all the crazy shit that went down in this deal. It's absolutely yeah. bonkers. And, you know, honestly, the experience of reading this book was, yeah, I'm actually just going to go back to middle school social studies, right? So you learn <laughs> about the US, US government and you imagine a whole bunch of just these like really serious people who are making the government work. And then you get older and you get jaded because you're watching like C-SPAN or CNN or MSNBC or Fox and you just see fighting and like chaos and there's just all these things that go wrong. And so there's this classic trope. Is it Veep in that everyone is just incompetent? Or is it House of Cards in that everyone has <laughs> right. this some like mastermind and they're all wheeling and dealing and being super sketchy and all that kind of fun stuff? I mean, this was freaking House of Cards. Minus Absolutely. all the murdering. But actually, first, speaking of houses, Jen, I am so annoyed that my husband got to see your house before I did. Like, Aww. how is that fair? Like, Wait, the by the way, that sounds he, really creepy. So for our listeners, mm -hmm. Kristen's husband was not like casually coming over to my house. <laughs> he was in town for work and mm -hmm. I invited him and his lovely female colleague over for- Love how you have to like specify that it's a female. <laughs> well, I don't. I just, I want to make sure that it was- um, Above board. But, Christian, if you're listening. Exactly. Well, it's, it, yeah, like, hey, I had my friend's husband over. And at breakfast, we were talking about, like, how did you get to breakfast? But mm -hmm. it was funny because I was texting with him the day before being like, hey, tell me, like, your coffee and bagel order. And mm -hmm. he was like, I don't drink coffee. And I was like, hey, listen, I get it. I went through, like, a matcha phase recently, which I have now emerged from. Like, I get it. Not everybody drinks coffee. Are you a tea person? He was like, yeah, do you have iced tea. And I was like, well, luckily it's the South. So actually I do have mm -hmm. one sad unopened container of iced tea in the back of my fridge, but who drinks iced tea for 
you record. did have to specify. He thought it was funny that you asked him if you wanted it sweetened or unsweetened. Because oh, yeah, in the usually South, it's just ask, sweetened. Sweet or unsweet. And it's, yeah, in the South, sweet tea is a thing. And 100%. I feel like up North, that's definitely not. No. Everyone, it's, no. it's unsweetened. So speaking of John, again, my husband, I love him, obviously. And he is one of our greatest supporters. He listens to our podcast every week. He's super sweet. But he is like, when, whenever we get excited about something, I swear he is like a wet blanket half of the time. Jen and I got really excited because last week, A-Rod followed us, which was kind of oh, like, yeah. you know, we felt like really cool and special or whatever. And I Hi, messaged A-Rod, if John. <laughs> yeah. Come on our podcast. <laughs> Seriously. And I messaged my husband like, hey, A-Rod followed us. How cool is that? And he goes, do you think he's even running his account? And I was just like, really? So anyway, Jen had been messaging. I texted like, him and I was like, Kristen's going to be the next Madison LaCroix. <laughs> no, 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 no. But anyway, so John was like, did, did Jen enjoy seeing me? And I was like, yes, of course she enjoys seeing you. So he was, he, he had a great time. I mean, John Your is house is gorgeous. Is lovely hosting you here. And thank you for being our biggest troll because when you actually like something, it means the world. Yes. Yes. He messaged us yesterday and said, I like your mini skinny, which we were like, it's really a skinny yeah, mini, skinny, but skinny. again, that is the, the greatest compliment that we have gotten because it is a high bar to get. And that raised. is hard fought. Exactly. So it now is you hard guys will fought. understand when you get like nothing but skinny minis for the next year, it's because John gave it the stamp of approval. Well, in today's episode, I, I mean, I don't think we're going to call it a skinny mini. Like we change our minds all the time, but we are going to try to keep this short because mm-hmm. it is going to get pretty technical. So we don't want to lose people. So anyway, what this book does is it takes the understanding that I often give, like we have a 90 second video on what is a leverage buyout. And so you obviously can't get into the details. We simplify things at first because it allows you to sort of set it in your brain and then you can fill in the details with all the missing pieces. And so I know for Jen, this was something that the book was really helpful for you to do because the way that we explain leverage buyouts is it's like buying a house. Basically, you buy a house primarily funded with debt. If you're buying, call it a $10 million house, you have to put in, call it 30% of the purchase price as the equity. So $3 million and the remaining $7 million comes from a bank. That is exactly what a private equity firm does. Then over time, they usually hold it for three to seven years. They improve the business. And then the goal is obviously to sell it for more than they bought it for. And that is how they achieve this return. Now, what we have not talked about is what happens when a leverage buyout goes bad because it actually does happen. And Uh what this book does so well is it not only gets into the specifics of the leverage buyout and the deal process, but it Mm -hmm. also covers distressed debt and restructuring, something Mm -hmm. that as Sajit says, he made this book because he wanted to explore this corner of Wall Street that had not really yet been explored in a book-like format. So I mean, Jen, like where, where should we begin? (laughs) I know, right? I know. Okay. So I think first, let's just summarize what actually happened with Caesars, very high level. Mm -hmm. So, oh, sorry, Renee's here again. Mm -hmm. So actually, we begin our tale (laughs) Mm -hmm. with an American casino and hotel company called Harrah's. And Harrah's owned a... (laughs) I know, Chris Harrah's says Harrah's. Hurrah! (laughs) With (laughs) Harrah's. And they owned a bunch of casinos in Nevada. So like Reno and Las Vegas, right? In New Jersey, Atlantic City, the... I guess the Reno of the (laughs) the Northeast and the Southeastern United States. Mm -hmm. And between 2006 and 2008, two private equity firms, Apollo and TPG. And by the way, sorry, these are those classic mega funds that we talked about in our Kate and Cam episode. They're, they're huge. They have a ton of assets under management. So they're capable of doing these massive deals. Exactly. These are the big guys. So mm-hmm. they bought Harrah's in a $30 billion LBO. They renamed it Caesars after Caesars Palace, which was the crown jewel property in their portfolio to try to like capitalize on their luxury image and rebrand with the plan mm-hmm. of ultimately growing the company and selling it at a profit in this private mm-hmm. equity model. Mm-hmm. Well, for any amateur student of history. (laughs) We all know that the economy (laughs) fell apart in 2008. So almost Mm -hmm. immediately after the LBO closed, the company began careening towards disaster. Mm -hmm. And so a series of restructurings ensued, which amounted to this totally crazy soap opera of Mm -hmm. Apollo and TPG jockeying for position (laughs) against the company's creditors, the owners of their debt. Those were all done with the intent of the equity holders superseding yeah, the, equity the creditors yeah. Yeah. exactly in the event of a bankruptcy, which ultimately did unfold. And yes. so we'll talk a little bit about capital structure and subordination and why, mm-hmm. again, if you're listening to this and you're like, I don't know anything about subordination. I don't know anything about capital structure. That's like saying the sun rises in the West and sets in the East. 
It's yes. so unheard of for equity investors to supersede creditors well, in a bankruptcy. Yes. One of the diagrams I used to always love to show people is that there is this relationship, right? The higher the risk, the higher the reward. So the top is the least risky. So you're going to get paid the lowest rate. And then as you start to become more risky, you, you start to get paid a higher rate and so on and so forth. And equity is the most risky. So they get the highest return, right? They're going to have the mm -hmm. highest IRR, the highest rate. Again, that's that sort of 25% IRR that private equity firms tend to target. But again, it means that if something goes wrong, if there's a bankruptcy, you expect that they're going to get wiped out first. But because exactly. of all of these wheelings and dealings and shady stuff of like transferring assets and all this, it, it meant that the private equity firms were trying to protect themselves in the case of a bankruptcy so that they would get their money back at, at the expense of the more senior creditors. And so that's where some of this drama unfolds. I think people alternately think about capital structures as, you know, those like plastic carafes of cereal. And either you have a lid at the top and when you have a workout, you start taking out who gets paid from the top. That's how you described it with the senior creditors being at the top of the capital structure that they get paid. They're the cream of the crop. And then everyone who's the crumbs at the bottom, the equity investors get wiped out in a bankruptcy or like a cereal dispenser in like a cafeteria where there's the screw mm. at the bottom, you know, the twist off and, and cash yes. flows out of the bottom. And so yeah. in a bankruptcy, when the bottom falls out, actually, right, yeah. it, it, it cascades down the capital structure. And I think that would be really interesting to illuminate in a video, the yeah. two different ways of thinking about it. Neither is wrong. Uh, right. It's but again, it's, it depends on kind of how you're thinking about it and what the purpose of it is for what the easiest kind of visual is. Okay. And mm -hmm. so finally, years later, when Caesars declared bankruptcy, basically all hell broke loose in a series of lawsuits, pitting the kind of titans of private equity against the biggest names in investing in credit. So the hedge fund, um, yeah, and distressed debt investors, hedge, fund hedge world, funds. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So, okay. That's the drama mm -hmm. today. <laughs> First, mm -hmm. we're going to start with just the LBS. Perfect. So let's get down to brass tacks with this deal structure. The deal was a partnership between Apollo and TPG. And we're going to talk about this a little bit in our conversation with Sajit. But again, yep. in the early 2000s, there was a preponderance of these so-called club deals, or these yep. deals where a couple of the big mega funds would partner together in some of the biggest LBOs in history, like the TXU LBO, mm -hmm. Toys, Toys R, R Us, Us, things like that. Yeah, there were some Sun really Guard, big, yeah. famous LBOs that happened <laughs> around the turn of the century, which sounds so creepy to say, by the way. So again, we talk about that equity contribution, like Kristen said, the $3 million towards your $10 million house. By the way, I love that we're buying $10 million houses on this podcast. I know. Uh, so let's talk about the actual equity that the sponsors, again, yeah. Apollo and TPG are our sponsors, the private equity firms behind this deal that they contributed. There was a total of about $6 billion in equity contributions towards the original deal. However, mm -hmm. Apollo and TPG each only put up something on the order of about 1.3 billion themselves. So combined, they put up less than half of the total equity. The rest mm -hmm. came from co-investors. And so on that list, they had Blackstone, they had Goldman yeah. Sachs, Credit Suites, Deutsche Bank, Oak Tree, Silver Point, Oak Hill. Again, Oak is like, I live in Charlotte and we have the Oak <laughs> Tree canopy here. So it's, you know, one of these things that people love to lean on in finance. Um, you had the Michael J. Fox Foundation, which is yeah. dedicated towards Parkinson's research. Actually, fun fact, Laura, my college roommate, who we talk about all the time in podcast, used to work at the Michael J. Fox Foundation. So hi, Laura. Mm -hmm. Um, you had Bob Kraft, the owner of the Patriots. There were even yeah. mid-level Harris executives who were co-investors in the I know, that was that, so yeah. Everyone had their hand in this thing, okay? All investors across all risk appetites on the spectrum were involved right. in this deal, which in hindsight Well, and crazy. I think, right. Well, and I think a lot of the stuff with the deal structure speaks to the markets at the time, right? The, the deal was announced in 2006. So something right. to keep in mind that it takes time for a deal to be announced and a deal to close. So it was announced in 2006. They had to get a whole bunch of these casino licenses. So it took time until it ultimately closed in licenses, 2008. Right. The gaming licenses. Jen and I, we started our careers on Wall Street in 2006, 2007. Shit was crazy. So the fact that they were able to do this almost $30 billion LBO, they paid a 40% premium to where the existing share price was trading. And at your point, that put it at a, this is a really important metric in finance in the world of banking is what multiple of EBITDA are you buying the company for? So they bought for 10 times EBITDA. Now, 
when you talk about how much debt you're taking on, you also talk about debt as a multiple of EBITDA. So it actually makes sense, right? They're buying a company for 10 times and then they're able to borrow. And I forget the exact amount, but it was something like eight times debt to EBITDA. So the portion of equity that they were putting in, again, was, was pretty small. And part of the thing that was interesting as well was how they were projecting the company would do over the next, call it five years. So that Apollo TPG model was forecasting this 40% increase in EBITDA that would put the valuation by the time they sold at like $40 billion, which again is great because if you look at it on an IRR basis, what happens over that time, they generate all this cash flow, they pay down their debt. Not only are they growing the value of the firm, they're also paying down the debt, right? So their equity is growing. They put in this teeny amount of equity, they're getting a large chunk of equity out. Yay, 20, 27% IRR. Everyone's happy. Everyone wants party. Here's the problem. That's not how the world worked. 2008, financial crisis hit and everything goes to hell in a handbasket. So that is, I think, just a really critical thing to understand is their expectations, their model was so yeah. off because nobody saw that the punch bowl was going to get taken away, right? This was the era of everything going up. And back to the point that you had made, Jen, was on this co-invest idea. So co-investing is something you actually see all the time these days. The club deals where you would have these multiple private equity firms band together to buy these large companies has fallen out of favor. There was problems with too many cooks in the kitchen. You had TPG and Apollo, and you actually see this drama play out in the book where Apollo is pretty aggressive in like some of the things These guys that they don't always do. play nicely together. They don't play nice at all. But yeah, the, the private equity firms, because they're both operators. And so all these private equity firms, they want to get in, they want to run the business and there's clashes, right? So that was problem number one. And problem number two is there was some, you know, questionable things that were going on when people were actually trying to bid and buy the businesses. Mm -hmm. And so there was regulations that got put in place that prevented that from happening now. However, it actually is these days quite common to see this co-invest idea, which is private equity firm wants to buy a business, but they can't cut a large enough equity check. So in other words, they want to buy, I'm making this up, a $10 billion business. They can't put in more than call it $2 billion of equity for whatever reason. So they might go to one of their investors, one of their LPs. So an LP is like your pension funds, your endowments, right? And they might say, do you want to invest alongside of us passively where you're not going to be making decisions, but you have all this money you're putting to work. You're not going to have to pay the fees, the two and 20. Do you want to go in alongside of us? And then both parties are happy. You can buy larger deals. So that's something that's been a huge trend post financial crisis, but you don't see these club deals anymore. Pre the financial crisis, you saw these club deals. You also did see the co-invest post financial crisis. You don't really see those club deals and you are still, however, seeing a lot of the co-investing. And it makes a ton of sense. I'd love to yeah. be, again, just from a lazy standpoint, right? Wouldn't you love to be a co-investor? You just co-invest yeah. in a bunch of deals. You don't Seriously. have to worry about the day-to-day -day operations to these firms. And you just sit back and wait for the checks to roll in it's mailbox exactly. money, right? Exactly. So it, it totally makes sense. And so, again, we've talked about the equity contribution. Now let's talk about the debt. Since we're talking about a leveraged buyout, the debt mm -hmm. was a critical piece of this. First of all, it's important to understand how that debt gets structured. Remember, in a leveraged buyout, it's not like Apollo and TPG go out and borrow a bunch of money. The company that they are mm -hmm. buying goes out and borrows this money in the markets. So there needs to be confidence from investors that that company can support all the debt that you are now burdening it with. Right. And so in order to do this, they came up with a very interesting structure that was a function of the market at the time. So the Caesar's parent, we'll call it, had an operating company that was a wholly owned subsidiary of it. And that's where most of the casino assets were held. As and collateral. actually, can we break this down a little further? It's funny because you say parents and it's something that I've never actually sat down and tried to explain. And I feel like a lot of people might be confused if this is the first time they're hearing it is what does that mean parent or operating company or like mm. subsidiary? I'm trying to think of a great analogy where it's like something is just a figurehead, but a bunch of people underneath are running around generating all the revenue. Right, 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 um, right. Someone's at the top, but it's really the busy bees <laughs> that like... It's like a brand. I was um, going to say Kim Kardashian, and then you have all of the little... Well, actually, it kind of is. Because if you think about Kim Kardashian as a figure and as a brand, if you're like, what's Kim Kardashian worth? Well, there's a whole bunch going on with Kim Kardashian. So there's Kim Kardashian, the persona. How much is her brand worth? Well... You've got all the things that are regularly generating cash flow. You've got her skims business. You've got her Instagram account and how much she gets paid. 
something like $1.6 million for every Instagram post. Then mm -hmm. you've got her TV shows or Keeping Up with the Kardashians or whatever the new iteration it's, is, right? Yep, that's Those it. It's just all, Hulu. Whatever it is. Those are all <laughs> revenue generating things. Think about that as the operating company in the analogy of the Caesar structure that we're talking about. Kim herself is the parent, right? Mm -hmm. The operating company is all of her businesses that are making money. And then Kim also has her huge real estate portfolio. She's got her bajillion dollar house in Calabasas or wherever the hell it is mm -hmm. that are theoretically assets that can appreciate. Those are collateral as well for potential loans. And so in the Caesar structure, they bifurcated under the parent, the operating company, again, all of the businesses that were generating revenue and cash flow, yeah. and the physical real estate of the casinos into mm -hmm. something called a prop co, a property company. And they used the collateral of those casinos to then take out debt that otherwise would not have been supported by the cash flows of the operating company. And why is that? Well, remember, yeah. this was 2006, 2007. We were in the middle of a commercial and residential real estate bubble. So Ooh, these casinos, yeah. just because of the physical space that they took up, were very valuable assets that could themselves support a bunch of debt. So it was, it was really interesting to me reading this because when I was in sponsors, all I did all day, every day was we would get private equity firms come to us say, Hey, we want to buy this company. How can it be structured? And so in general, when you're thinking about the structuring of a typical leverage buyout, you typically have senior debt, you have subordinated debt, and then you have equity. Now, the way that the senior debt can be raised can vary. So there's usually some kind of revolver, like a revolving credit facility. I think of it like a credit card for a company. You then have the term loans. You can have a term loan A, a term loan B, a term loan C. There's all these different term loans. Then there's these subordinated loans. They are mm -hmm. lower in the capital structure, meaning they are going to be paid back second in line in a bankruptcy, right? They're going to carry a higher rate, all that kind of fun stuff. So then you would have either subordinated debt, high yield debt. You could have second lien loans. There's, there's different ways that that could be subordinated, but that mm -hmm. is the high level structure. So I think it's helpful to think of it that way. And one of the things that I love that they did in the book is that they actually broke down who were the investors in the, the senior debt. Mm -hmm. And it was the, the first lien debt. And then who were the investors in subordinated debt? So anyway, with that as the backdrop, Jen, if you want to get into some of the specifics, but I, I do think it's important to also note that I had never seen someone be like, you know, we're going to also do, we're going to get some CMBS loans in addition to the loans that are supported by the cash flows that the company is generating. I had not seen someone be like, you know what? Yeah, let's do some CMBS And it's CMBS not something you could do today. There's no oh, chance no. in hell that you could do this today. And so <laughs> Commercial that, real estate these days, hell the F no. <laughs> today, and again, it wasn't done at the time, like you said. So that's one yeah. of the things that we really, really, really want to hammer home is like, this was such a crazy, unusual deal. This yeah. was a, yeah. a flying elephant. It just didn't happen. So yeah. at the Opco, <laughs> So this is where all of this is Skims, Kim Kardashians, right? is, yeah, Skims. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is, this is Skims, okay? We were able to take out something to the tune of $7 billion in bank loans, $6 billion in bridge loans that would ultimately go to be refinanced into high-yield bonds. And I just want to explain what that means. It means that you're mm -hmm. getting a loan from the bank at the time of the LBO, and then you ultimately are going to go out to the public markets and raise bonds. So a loan is actually coming from a bank. The bank gives you the money, you pay interest to the bank, whereas high yield bonds are coming from your institutional investors. Actually, I guess the like institutional investors can also do loans, but it's a different type of a security. So high yield bonds are actual securities, you know, they trade, blah, 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 blah. These loans are, are different. The idea is you have these loans that the bank is giving that you ultimately want to get off of the bank's books and refinance them into bonds. Think about it this way. When you take out your mortgage from the bank, your bank goes and securitizes that mortgage 99% of the time, unless it's not eligible for securitization, into a mortgage-backed security and sells it off to investors because they don't want those loans on their portfolio. Until they can securitize them, they sit on the bank's portfolio and the bank is wearing that risk. They don't yeah. want that risk. They want to securitize yeah. that risk and socialize it among the investor pool. And so if a bank is unable to securitize these bridge loans into bonds, they are called hung bridges. And that is ultimately what did happen with this deal, but, but we'll get into that in a bit. Okay, high level, here's the structure of the deal. The equity investors contributed a total of $6 billion between the sponsors and the co-investors. The deal was then funded with $24 billion in debt. 
And that was broken down into $7 billion in bank loans, $6 billion in bridge loans. And remember, these ultimately become high yield bonds. So first lien bonds and second lien bonds, six and a half billion in CMBS funding and four and a half billion of Harris original debt that remained. And actually just let me jump in quickly to say the math here. So $24 billion worth of debt, their EBITDA was $3 billion. So that is basically eight times leverage. So, wow. Yeah. So just like I said, with your mortgage, when the bank issues you a mortgage, they're ultimately going to securitize it. This is the same thing that they did at the PropCo with the casinos that were under that umbrella. Instead of going out and taking out new mortgages on these casinos, they borrowed money that was securitized into commercial mortgage-backed securities and then sold off to investors because of that huge investor demand. So again, due to that securitization process, Caesar's parent was able to use the PropCo to take out something on the order of six and a half billion dollars of real estate loans that otherwise would not have been supported. The mm -hmm. same amount of debt that was taken out in the form of bridge loans on the OPCO was also taken out on the PropCo, effectively doubling that level of access to the credit market, which is and that's, huge, yeah. insane, and would not happen today. Yeah. And that's also why I think they probably had something like six times the leverage, excluding the commercial real estate loans. And then when you added that in, the numbers got up to like eight, which again, is just absolute insanity. I mean, and speaking of insanity. ratios, one other metric, and we'll talk about some of the metrics that we measured this LBO by, but one other metric to have in the back of your mind was that at the time of the deal's inception, the ratio of cash flows to interest expense was something like one and a half times. So the coverage ratio, basically you take EBITDA over the interest. Meaning again, if you think about as a borrower in the mortgage market, your lender is going to pull your debt to income ratio. How much money are you making in your job? And how much are you expected to pay every month on your student loans, your car loans, and now your house? Same thing we look at with companies. We look at what their cash flow, their EBITDA is relative to the amount of interest expense, how much they are expected to pay on all of their outstanding loans. And if that ratio is less than about two, it's considered very risky. At inception, mm -hmm. that ratio was about one and a half, and it only and, got worse, as you can imagine. Yeah. And the way that I like to think about it is almost how many years worth of interest can you pay with your current level of operating cash flow? So mm -hmm. when you say that your EBITDA over the interest was one and a half, you can cover one and a half years with your current level. Now, what mm -hmm. we are about to find out is that that current level of operating cash flow is going to go down. So obviously that's going to be problematic as they actually need to pay their interest expense. Um, that's exactly right. Okay. So remember we talked about the existing debt at the operating company that was not refinanced. Let's talk mm -hmm. about why that was so unusual. We touched on this a little bit in an earlier episode. I want to say it was either with Harry Mameski. I think but, it was with Harry because um, we were talking about there's mm -hmm. this potential rumor of an LBO in the market. How does that affect the bonds? Yeah. And so if you are a creditor, meaning you own the debt of a company, what is actually in those debt agreements, in those bonds, in those loans are typically covenants. And we've talked about this in the past, so we're not going to get into it in too much detail here. But typically amongst those covenants is a change of control provision, meaning if Caesar's parent is not controlled by the former management and again, were they to be a public company, the public shareholders, if there is a change of control, then that typically triggers a restructuring event in the bonds or in fact, and, a, an event of default. Yeah. And, and one other thing is there's also probably going to be some kind of covenant where it says if your leverage, and, and by the mm -hmm. way, so I just want to define leverage. Leverage is how much debt you have over your EBITDA. And this mm -hmm. actually, by the way, fun fact, I think of this as how many years will it take you to pay down your debt? Mm -hmm. So they were previously, I think, an investment grade company. So you as they an were. investor, you had lent money to Harrah's and the risk was quite low. You were not getting a high interest rate. Well, if now you get massive amounts of debt piled on the company, you should get paid back because this is not what you signed up for. So that's why there's either change of control provisions. There are these covenants where if the total leverage goes over some amount, you'll get paid back. And they didn't have that. So now they're sitting right. there getting this measly little non-high rate and there is a mountain of debt that just gets piled on and nothing they can do about it. 
So, so again, your point, by non-high those, yeah. rate, <laughs> when you've got <laughs> investment grade versus high yield bonds, we've always talked about risk reward. Investment grade bonds tend to carry lower coupons than those that are high yield at issuance. Again, high yield by definition. You were not getting compensated for the risk of owning the credit of this highly levered, much riskier company that you probably going to go be, bankrupt. Right? Yeah, <laughs> you yeah, should exactly. Be. exactly. And yeah. so at the end of the day, what this all boils down to talking about these covenants, because of the massive demand for this product at the time of the LBO, they were able to issue covenant light debt. There was just, mm-hmm. and so that was an actual term covenant light. And the one <laughs> and fun fact, it's spelled L I T E. That's how people usually spell it. Covenant L I T E. Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, because everything in finance, you're supposed to spell bot, B-O-T. That was one of the things I had to get really adjusted to when I first started on (laughs) Wall Street. But the one covenant that was in place on all of this new debt was that the senior secured debt to EBITDA ratio had to be above a certain threshold. And that threshold was insanely high. What did Sajid say it was? I think it was six. But so senior secured means it's just the senior debt. So we're not talking all of the debt. We're just talking those bank loans. And in a normal LBO, I used to see this go up to maybe four at the aggressive end. So senior secured at six, that is beyond aggressive. And to just look at the senior secured debt debit and that be the one test, mind boggling that Mm -hmm. it would be this lenient. Exactly. Mind boggling. Exactly. So there were a bunch of other cool little factoids about the deal that we're just going to run through here really quickly from our notes. Just some stuff that I thought was really cool. You know, think about this. Think about how everyone has their hand in the honey jar as these deals Mm -hmm. are going down. So you've got syndication fees to all the banks that are involved, close to a billion dollars, all right? Mm -hmm. Apollo and TPG, who are the people buying this company? pay themselves a consulting fee of $100 million a piece just for closing the deal. You had annual monitoring fees to those firms of something like 1% of EBITDA, which is another like $30 Mm -hmm. million a year. The CEO, Gary Loveman, had a $100 million payday when the deal closed. Now, I think he did roll something like $25 million of that back into the deal. But Sajit talks a lot about the fact that he loved the private equity, like glitterati lifestyle he was leading and all these titans of industry he was hanging out with. Yeah, well, and he was also based in Boston. So he was a professor at Harvard and was obviously hired to run this Las Vegas-based company. So he would travel back and forth on his private jet. And it was actually hilarious because like later on, after the company went bankrupt, I think it was the bankruptcy judge was kind of not poking fun, but making digs at him for the fact that he was traveling back and forth on the company dime in this like private jet to go to Las Vegas. But to your point, he loved (laughs) the literati lifestyle, right? That is exactly right. This is probably actually a really great time to hit pause for a recording today. So we've (laughs) covered, yeah, yeah, like 45 minutes in. So we've covered the basic (laughs) setup of the deal. And hopefully this little crash course into one of the craziest LBOs of all time has given you some kind of deep insight into the deal structuring and the mechanics that hopefully, you know, might help you in your interview prep for investment banking, or at least help you understand like what is actually going on if you read about the deals in the news. So stick around because in our next episode, we're going to talk about what happens when things fall apart, (laughs) kind of drama that ensues there. That's exactly right. We are so excited to tackle all the rest of the drama. Like this was nothing. So Mm -hmm. hope you guys enjoyed this episode. Thank you so much for listening. Please leave us a five-star written review on whatever podcast platform you use to listen. And we will talk to you next time. Thank you so much for listening to The Wall Street Skinny. We are more than just a podcast. So follow us on TikTok and Instagram at The Wall Street Skinny. If you're a visual learner, we have content that will help get you up the curve from valuation to Excel to Bond Fundamentals 101. And if you haven't done so already, please subscribe to our YouTube channel where we will be publishing in-depth tutorials on all this and more. 